Isaiah chapter number 60. We'll begin reading in verse number 15. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of the kings. Thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. For brass I will bring gold, and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood, brass." And for stones, iron. I will also make thy officers peace, and thine exactors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. The sun shall no more, sorry, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall give, shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, thy glory. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall the moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be with thine everlasting light, and the day, and the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people also shall be all righteousness, they shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, hasten it in his time. This portion of scripture appears to be a prophecy concerning the last days. Either the millennial reign of Christ or the new Jerusalem, as is described in Revelation chapter number 21. The passage speaks of the blessings of the Lord, but the phrase that struck me is in verse number 19. The Lord shall no, sorry, the Lord shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, thy glory. Title of this morning's message, Thy God, Thy Glory. Let's pray. Father, you know all that goes on. You know the infirmities and weaknesses that we have. We come caring nothing for those, but only for your spirit who can carry the day in any situation under any circumstances. We ask that your spirit would use your word to draw us to yourself. We ask that your word and your word only would be spoken and that each heart would hear it clearly the message that you have for us. For the sake of the Lord Jesus who purchased everything that we, your children, need, we cry and expect your blessing. We ask this in the precious name of Christ. Amen. If I asked you this morning, what is the natural glory of the earth? What would your answer be? What is the natural glory of the earth? What makes the earth so special? The natural glory of the earth. Some might say, well, it's majestic mountains make it special. Others might say it's beautiful vegetation. Others might say it's abundant water. Others might say it's variety of life species. Others might say it's ecosystem. Now, all of those things are both interesting and special. But the real answer to the question, what is the natural glory of the earth, the real answer to that question is the sun. The sun is the glory of the natural earth. Ask yourself, what are the mountains if if there's no sun to shine on them? You have nothing. What is vegetation without the sun? Nothing. 
what is water without the sun? One solid chunk of ice. What is life without the sun? Without the sun, there is no life. There is no ecosystem. The sun is the glory of the earth. And we could go into a lot more specifics, but I think that's pretty easy to see. In the New Jerusalem, according to Revelation chapter number 21, there will be no need of a sun. Why? Because the Lord himself will be the light. Now try to draw this parallel in your mind. And just to make sure we're all on the same page here, how many in your mind can envision a green meadow with a stream running through it with mountains in the background with a nice blue sky? How many of you can envision that in your mind? Okay. Okay. The absolute beauty of that, we've seen them, they're all over the place. The absolute beauty of that, okay? Envision that in your mind with the sun shining down on it. You've got that in your mind. Now, take away the sun from that scene. The sun has not been there. We're not just talking about nighttime. We're talking about no sun. Now what do you envision in your head? Dark, cold, frozen, hard, uninviting, dead. Okay, do you understand that? You've got your meadow with the sun. You've got that beautiful. Without the sun, you have nothing. Now let's look at verse number 19 again. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, thy glory. In the new Jerusalem, this is the part that the Lord is going to have. He will be the sun, and in his presence is fullness of joy. That bright, happy existence is there because the Lord is the light. without his presence. And there will be many who live at that same time without that presence. What do you have? A very fearful sight. Dark and scary. The Lord himself will be the light. The glory of the earth is the sun. The glory of heaven in our lives is God. We have the phrase in verse number 19, the last phrase, But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. We understand that phrase, but thy God thy glory is odd to us when we read it alone. When I say that, thy God thy glory, your mind says, wait, what did you just say? When we read the whole phrase, it makes sense. So let's read it again. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. It makes sense when we read it. But when we read it by itself, thy God thy glory, it doesn't make sense. Why? Nobody has an opinion. Is anybody alive here today? There's no light, okay, but why doesn't it make sense English-wise? It's not the way we would say it. Why does it make sense in, like we would say it when we read the whole phrase, but when we just read the last phrase, thy God, thy glory, doesn't make sense? Aha, the English lady in the t class. How many else? That was just on the tip of my tongue. There is no verb in the phrase. Therefore, it is not a sentence. Because there is no verb there. When we read it all together, it makes sense because it borrows the verb from the first phrase. And we put it into the second phrase because it borrows the two. The first phrase, But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, 
we borrow that shall be in our second phrase, and thy God shall be thy glory. Now do you get it? Now do you understand why it didn't make sense when you just say it alone? Because it's borrowing the, the verb from the first phrase. So it actually should read, thy God shall be thy glory. This makes sense. In the new Jerusalem and for all eternity, God will be our son. He will be the glory of our existence. Everything that we have and be and are will revolve around him. Thy God shall be thy glory. Now this is not hard to understand or envision. Your mind doesn't have to work at it or balk at this at all. It is exactly what you expect in heaven for your life to revolve around God. Your God shall be your glory. You expect that. But does the verb have to be, shall be? Why cannot the verb be, is? Thy God is thy glory. Currently, thy God is thy glory. If God is an unchangeable God, and he is, and if he forever is going to be your glory, why can he not be so now? Why does, his, why does he have to share his glory with the things of this world? That is a very important question. Why does he have to share his glory with the things of this world? We know that he will be, he shall be, thy God shall be thy glory. Our world's going to revolve around him all the time, constantly. In the new Jerusalem, he'll be the son. Why can it not be now? Why does he have to share his glory with cars and entertainment and your job and your friends and with your family and with pleasures and politics and your own personal plans? Are we required to set our affection on those things to glory in them in this life? Yes, the whole world is doing that. The whole world is revolving themselves. They are trying to cause these things to be their son at this time. But is it a requirement? Is it a necessity that we must share the glory, God must share his glory with the things of this world? Cannot we now put God in his rightful place? Does it have to be, thy God shall be thy glory? Can it not be, thy God is thy glory? Can we not do that? The answer, my friend, to the question is yes. We can live that way right now. Your God can be your glory at this moment. He can be your son. You do not have to wait Wait to let God be your everything. You don't have to, pardon the expression, let make God play second fiddle to the things of this world. The kingdom of God is within you. And you don't have to wait for the world to end to enjoy it. The kingdom of God is within you, and you do not have to wait for the world to end to make that so. Well, let me see if I can prove this to you and show you the way to this at the exact same time. Consider for me, if you will, the details of the plan of salvation. I think most here are familiar with this. The plan of salvation has... <coughs> Four basic points to it. One, I have to know that I am a sinner. Most people don't have too much time, get trouble getting a hold of this. Almost everybody knows, you know what? I have sinned at least some. Most people said I have sinned a lot. Most people said I have sinned an enormous amount. We have all sinned. I think almost everybody comes to grips with that. We're all sinners. 
That's the first point of the gospel. The second point of the gospel is we all deserve hell. Look, heaven has requirements. It's a perfect place. And if you have sin, you're not perfect. Therefore, you don't fit. And therefore, you are not qualified to get into heaven because of your sin. Because of my sin, I have sin, and I do not qualify for heaven. We all understand this, I think. So the answer to the question is point number three, Jesus Christ is the answer. If you've read your Bible, you know that Jesus Christ came from heaven. He's God the Son. He, we call it the incarnation. He, God, took on a human body. He was born as a human baby. He lived on this earth 33 years, never sinning. God in a human body. He died on the cross. Our sin was placed on him. He was declared guilty of our sin, and he was punished in our place. He died for us. He died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He came out of the grave because our sin was paid for. Had he stayed in the grave, we'd be in trouble because we wouldn't know what happened. But because our sin put him in the grave, when he came out of the grave, we know that our sin was paid for. This is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We all intrinsically know, this is, I've, I don't know how many times I've asked this question to people, is everybody going to heaven? I don't think in all the times, I've had, I must have asked that a thousand, over a thousand times, maybe thousands of times of people, is everybody going to heaven? And I don't think I've ever got an answer that said, yes, I believe everybody's going to heaven. We all intrinsically know, even people who don't know anything about the Bible, we all intrinsically know not everybody's going. So how can that be? If Christ died for the sins of the whole world and he rose from the dead, then how can it be that some don't go to heaven? And the answer is very, some don't go to heaven. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We call on the Lord, accept the Lord, his punishment for our sin. We accept his death, and we are saved. Now, I think for most people in here, you understand that completely. You need to be saved, I, as the Bible calls it. You need to be saved. And today is your day. But I go to church every Sunday just to make sure. Uh, you'd say, um, whoa there, pal. you got a problem here. You would say, going to church is good and you ought to go. But don't be mixing going to church in with your salvation. Right. Don't be doing that. You can't mix the two. If I said to you, I put my faith in Christ, but I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments just to be on the safe side, you'd say, you ought to obey the Ten Commandments, but they're not going to get you to heaven. You have the finished work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I was talking to a kid at Meyer Hall. It's been a long time ago now, but I was talking to him, and he, I gave him the plan of salvation. He trusted Christ. He came out the next week, and we were talking, and after he, we talked for a little bit, he goes, now what I'm doing, he says, every night when I go to bed, he said, I say the Lord's Prayer and 18 Hail Marys. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, you know, quoting the Lord's Prayer, I said, that's scripture. I said, so there would be no real problem. You're quoting actual scripture. There. I, said, but I said, what are these Hail Marys? And he looked at me, and he scratched his head a little bit, and he says, she ain't got nothing to do with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you see, we would say, you can't add there. We don't allow anything into our salvation that would take the glory away from the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. He gets all the glory for our salvation. You understand that? And everybody here would fight, if you won't fight tooth and nail over that, I have to wonder about your salvation. Because we will all fight tooth and nail. You do not add any one thing, anything at all, to the finished work of Jesus Christ. He gets all the glory for our salvation.
We all understand that. Now, Christ is all Christ is the glory of my salvation and I will not allow anything else to slip in and steal that glory. Right and good. If you can do that with your salvation, then why can't you do that with your life? Follow me here. If you can do that with your salvation, why do you not do it with your life? When something would try to add itself to your life that would take some of the glory away from Christ, reject it. Just like you would reject saying a few Hail Marys at the end of the day just to make sure. If something tries to put itself into your life that's going to take away from any of the glory of God in your life, not, not happening here. You reject that. We do not have to let things of this world steal the glory away from God. You do not have to allow your hobby to put some of the sun of your life on it. Your family should not compete with the glory of God. Your job, your finances, your entertainment should not detract in any way from God having total glory in your life. You do it with your salvation. You will not allow anything in that would detract from the perfect finished work of God. You, you say, in my salvation, he is the son. All the glory to him. Then why do you have to allow anything in your life that would detract and take some of that glory, some of that sun from him? I bought something this week. It wasn't, it didn't, didn't end up being what I expected it to be. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and realized that item and God's glory cannot be together. This thing is going to, steals away from the glory of God. I got up in the morning and threw that thing in the garbage can. Why? Because nothing should be in my life that would take anything away from the total son of God in my life. He is the glory of my life, or should very well be. I know eventually he will be, he shall be, but he ought to be right now. I don't allow anything in the plan of salvation. He is the glory of my salvation. Therefore, I can also have him as the glory of my life. I do not have to allow anything in to steal his glory away. I'm not required to let it be. I can reject and keep God as the son. Thy God is thy glory in salvation. Thy God is thy glory in life. You know what? Our God should be our glory in this church. He should be the total glory of this church. Thy God is thy glory. Let me ask you, this church is doing very well financially. The Lord has really blessed us in that area, and it's doing very well financially. So why don't we take the, sur the surplus money that we have in our general fund and invest it in the stock market? Lots of churches do this, by the way. They invest in the stock market so they don't have to rely later on on the tithes and offerings of, of God's people. Why don't we do that? Because we say, if God can't keep the doors of this church open through the giving of his own people, if he can't provide that way, then we don't want the doors open. Right. Right. If God can't do it, we don't want the glory of the church going to the stock market. That's how they're keeping their doors open. They did some good financial investments. Nothing here should steal away any of the glory of God. 
I love the special music of this church. I love the choir. But since we like the music here, why don't we hire some professionals to come in and really do this thing right? You say, well, you know they do that, right? And we say, around here, there's only one glory, and that's God. And anybody, nobody takes away from any of that. Right. It is all to the glory of God. And we as his children will worship him. And that's, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. Nobody will steal any of the glory away from him. Why don't we hire a good speech writer and a good speech maker to fill this half hour? Good grief, there's got to be a million people in the world that's better than what you've got right now. That's the truth. You know why we don't? Because God has chosen the, the foolish things of this world, the weak things of this world, to confound the mighty. And when he uses weak nothings like what we have a church full of here, including the pulpit and especially the pulpit, when he uses weak things like that, there's no glory stealing there. He gets it all. And that's this church's whole focus. Thy God is thy glory. And anything that would detract and take away even the smallest minutia of the glory of God, we're going to throw it out the door. Yes, sir. It doesn't belong here. Nobody, nothing takes away from the glory of God. That's why we meet here. Yes, when we all meet in glory, he will be the son to all of us. But I say, why don't we get started right now? Thy God shall be son. Who needs it? Who needs it? God will be our glory. Thy God shall be thy glory. But in my opinion, I don't think we ought to wait. For thy God is thy glory in salvation. So why not say thy God is thy glory in your life and thy God is the glory in this church. Thy God Thy 